ages ago in elementary school, I was playing recorder and moved into playing trumpet in middle school bands and getting into jazz bands in high school and learning how to arrange for jazz bands, what it meant for each instrument to have its own voice and how to apply that. And that took me into college through with a music scholarship, which ended in a music degree, and that's kind of how it all started for me. I kind of backdoored my way into engineering producing. I, I always read albums and album covers when I was a kid, but I never really thought of a record producer as an attainable job. I never really kind of equated the two. And I happened to be at University of Miami for a whole nother reason. And somebody came in, started talking about the music engineering program at University of Miami. And they started talking about this job, like, you know, being in the studio and recording. And I was like, why am I not doing that? That sounds like something that I would love. I guess my big break looking back on it now would be working on the Wallflowers, Bringing Down the Horse record with T-Bone Burnett. That album ended up selling a lot of records and it, it did very well. And I think that was kind of a springboard for me to gain other projects and gain the momentum to kind of start my career really going. Uh, when I'm working with a new band, I think the key for me is to kind of listen to the rough mix that comes in and find out what the kind of sonic concept and identity is. I find that rough mixes tend to be really good at giving you an overview of the direction of the artist and the sonic signature they're trying to accomplish. And it seems like to me, my job is to kind of really take it all the way. Sometimes they can't take it all the way to the right direction or there's sonic imperfections in the balances. And so I'll try to essentially maximize the vision that they kind of set forth in the rough. And that's not always the case. Sometimes the rough is really a board rough and it's, it is literally rough and every just like faders up. And at that point, you'll have to hopefully get some direction or sometimes they'll just say, we just trust you, go for it. And you kind of help guide that vision. I think my production process has gone through a metamorphosis. I'm doing mostly mixing these days, but I think with producing, I've kind of done less. I feel like earlier on, I was desiring to put more and more things onto a track to fill it up essentially, and now, I feel like my job is to leave space for the vocal and find a way to make each sound as important as it can be, as opposed to having 10 things that make up a particular sound. I'm definitely more in the box, probably 90 to 95% in the box at this point. And for me, when I do go outside of the box, I will go through a piece of gear and eventually print it back into the box so that when I'm done with a mix, it is all in the box at that point. And for me, that just makes my life a lot easier if there's any changes later down the line or if we're making stems down the line so that we don't have to be recalling gear. I think my mixing philosophy has changed less about musical genres and more about going from analog console to in the box. And within the box, I'm allowed, my routing capabilities are just so much more enormous that you can achieve things much easier than you could have on a console. Things that would have taken many patches and many pieces of gear are just all of a sudden at your fingertips. And so you can try and shape things in ways that were kind of not impossible, but very difficult, certainly if you're trying to do a song a day or whatever. 
And I've found that that's kind of been liberating for me, that I can go to further degrees on a mix and be more specific about exactly what I'm going for. Mixing for Broadway performances is definitely a different animal, but the interesting thing I think as far as my involvement in Broadway is that when I'm mixing a band or singer-songwriter, I'm just trying to get the essence of a specific sonic signature or a specific vibe. And with Broadway, I think I'm also trying to do that, but I think that the voices have to definitely be even more front and center. But I think the reason I kind of got involved or I've been brought into some of the Broadway things is that I'm trying to bring more of a pop-minded philosophy to how those records sound as opposed to mixing them maybe more like a more standard Broadway album or cast album might have been mixed. So I'll, I'll approach things even more same to how I would do a band um, and bring that element of my background to the cast albums. With mixing, it's really starting from the rough to just hear the vision. And then sometimes I'll start kind of the traditional drums, bass, guitars, or keyboards and build up the track that way. Sometimes if a track is really based on the vocal, I will start to make sure the vocal sounds great get some ideas of how that can kind of be in the world and then fit everything to that. Sometimes a track is really acoustic guitar driven and I just need to make sure that that thing sounds amazing through the whole song and then fit things around that. And so it really depends, there isn't a one way. I used to always start with drums and now I find that sometimes I really want to shape the drums around the rest of the track. And so again, it's just kind of liberating and taking a song from a different angle and you'll get different results, or at least I find that I do, and it makes it much more enjoyable for me. I came upon McDSP plugins a long time ago when a friend, Lars Fox, introduced them to me. We were working together on Everclear Records he was the Pro Tools guy and I was the engineer guy when they were two separate people. And it was amazing what you could do with them. I mean, sonically, they were so far superior at the time to anything that existed in the box. And so it was pretty much everything. We, that was the only thing we used when we were doing any kind of processing in the box. My go-to McDSP plugins can vary from project to project, but I definitely love the filter bank and the EQs because essentially I grew up on those from Everclear days, and they're just very musical to me. And depending on whether I need you know, lots of peaking or dipping stuff, or if I need shelves, I'll pick the E or the P version of the EQ. And then I've also loved the Futz box. I'm big into saturation and being able to control or shape the sounds of elements. And the MC2000 I'll use quite a bit for vocals, bass. I'll even use them on guitar groupings, things like that. And I also love the AE400, and I'll use that sometimes on an instrument where it may be getting in the way of a vocal, and I'll key it from, let's say, the vocal and allow that instrument to dip under the vocal anytime it's singing. So there's a lot of interesting uses for that plugin. I get asked the what advice question a lot, and that's a tough one. I think the, the biggest one for me is you have to love it because you are gonna put hours and hours and hours into the job most of it at the beginning, very thankless and very unpaid or very low paid. And so that has to not matter to you. It has, what has to matter is that you're in it for the music and you are love it, you are passionate about it, and you have that stick to that I kind of am talking about. 
eventually I think you'll find your way, you know, into a music career. So that's what I tell everybody. You have to be passionate and stick to it.